uh, talk, well, I actually have two talks lined up. Um, so hopefully I don't run over time or too much over time. Uh, the, there's the first half I'm gonna... There's not a hard limit. Okay, oh, great, perfect, perfect. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the first half of, <laughs> of however long this is gonna take is gonna be on tackling Super Smash Bros. Melee with the deep RL, uh, which is work I did uh, actually pretty much five years ago um, when I was still in grad school. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, I'll, I'll talk about uh, what I've been doing more recently on uh, AI for automated theorem proving uh, at DeepMind. Um, all right, so yeah, let's talk about Smash Bros. So uh, this, is, this is Smash Bros. Uh, it's a multiplayer um, fighting game platformer, kind of like Street Fighter mixed with Super Mario. And it's played on, played on this um, GameCube that was uh, released, I don't know, back in like 2000. And it's played on this uh, purple controller wonky looking thing here, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, so what does Super Smash Bros look like? So I have some GIFs in my slides. I don't know if you guys can see the GIFs uh, through Zoom all that well. I'm going to assume that something sensible is coming through, um, but uh, it works this now. is just some, okay, this is some Super Smash Bros. gameplay. The, the basic idea is that uh, it's a damage counter, which has a percent, but percent doesn't really mean anything. Uh, but every time you hit your opponent, the damage goes up. The more damage they have, uh, the further they get sent knocked back by your attacks. And the idea is to eventually rack up enough damage that you can sort of hit them all the way off the stage uh, and, and get a KO. Um, so on the left is like a series of attacks that sort of combine into each other and ends in a KO. And then on the right is actually a famous match between two of the best players in the world. And it's, uh, it's actually not sped up. Uh, and you can see the Fox player dashing back and forth very quickly to avoid the Princess Peach's attacks before launching his own counterattack. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's a very fast paced game. Um, all right, another interesting part about Melee is that there's a lot of what's sometimes known as Yomi, uh, where basically you have all these rock, paper, scissors, um, scenarios between different options you have. Uh, so this is just one example that I won't go into, but there's lots of different examples of um, sort of cycles of strategies that, that beat each other, uh, which adds a lot of depth and complexity and, and makes sort of reading and predicting your opponent important. Uh, so what does Melee look like uh, as an RL environment? Um, so first of all, the environment is simulated with this dolphin emulator. Um, and at the time, uh, this could run at about one to 2x uh, real time on, on the server hardware I had access to. And that's because it, you have to emulate the whole GameCube, which is pretty, uh, pretty expensive compared to something like Atari. Um, uh, there's no graphics. Uh, the, so it doesn't, the, the, the agent doesn't see pixels, it just sees a uh, game state, which is read from RAM uh, on each frame. And that includes things like the player positions, velocities, what direction they're facing, and you know, things like that. Um, probably the biggest, juiciest part of the, of the game state is actually this thing called the action state, of which there are 382 discrete uh, options. And this tells you whether your character is running, jumping, attacking, being hit, falling, things like that or slow down and stop until this obstacle has moved out of the way. So you're... Hello? I, I could hear someone. Did someone have a question? I think he just unmuted by accident. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I'll, I'll continue then. And, and uh, it's almost completely observable, the, the, the Smash Bros. Um, environment. Um, uh, the action space, uh, it, so if you look back at the controller on the previous uh, slide, you'll see it has uh, two analog control sticks, seven buttons, and two triggers. Um, each analog control stick has two discrete axes, uh, sorry, two continuous axes, um, which is a pretty pretty big space. Uh, but I took the liberty of compressing it down to about 50 discrete actions using my own knowledge of which uh, controller combinations are actually useful for Smash Bros. And then finally, the word, word structure is pretty straightforward. It's plus minus one every time you knock your opponent off stage or get knocked off stage yourself. Um, and then uh, plus minus 0.01 for every damage 
you deal or, or, or take. Um, so the second part could be seen as a bit of reward shaping, although I don't think it's too bad because those numbers are on screen for the humans to, to look at anyways, which they obviously do. Uh, all right. So, so I have a question about the observer sure. listening space there. Sure. So this is, so it says it's the game state's read from RAM. So is it just a like binary observation on all of the bits or? No, no so, so the, the, it's, um, the values are interpreted. So there's okay. floating point numbers for the positions and the velocities and the Boolean for the direction and a big one hot for this action state. Yeah, so everything is interpreted. Okay. So, so the, the, the perception part of it is um, sort of done done automatically yeah there's, so there's so no. um so how, how big was the vector at the end i suppose after so or? so the the biggest part is this 302 382 part so it's that times two um i think in total it came out to around 800 or 900 um okay. but most of it was in your your action state and your opponent's action state um yeah. was there do you try something other than a one hot vector because it seems a bit inefficient to me but um i, I guess i could and just embed it using like the regular like a vocab type embedding is that what you're uh, referring to yeah i mean it says it includes things like running jumping and attacking so it surely it'd be more efficient to store each of those separately um so uh, unfortunately this so this big enum it, it, yeah its meaning changes depending on like what character you have selected. So mm. uh, maybe you're su suggesting doing some sort of pre-processing where like yeah. I collapse some of this down. Yeah, I think it would require more work than I wanted to yeah, do. And, okay, uh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, I think I was happy to let the machine learning figure everything out that it needed to figure out. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, let me move on to some of the methods I used. So on the reinforcement learning side, I used um, uh, essentially what is now known as Impala, although it didn't, wasn't uh, a thing at the time. So it, it's sort of distributed advantage actor critic. Um, it's basically just a policy, like a reinforce with the baseline um, with about 50 to 200 environments running per experiment. And actually at the beginning, I had no importance weighting at all. So it was just like, I don't know, Allah. Um, and, and actually, it, 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 it actually worked relatively well, even without important splitting, um, although it did work a bit better once I did it. Um, I, I'll also say, as I mentioned uh, before the talk, I, I did try some Q-learning variants, and they didn't work that well, particularly once I moved on to the multiplayer version. Uh, they worked OK in the single player version, uh, but I, I, I didn't experiment with them uh, too much after. On the deep learning side, it was just really a small few layer MLP um, with initially some frame stacking to uh, to, to get the, um, the history. And then uh, I had a gated recurrent unit um, uh, added later. Uh, and then finally, on the, the way I generated data was through symmetric self-play. Um, there's a few variants on this. The first one I tried was uh, playing against opponents using the exact same parameters, which has the advantage of doubling the throughput, which is good because I didn't have access to that much compute at the time. Uh, and um, later on, I switched to learning against a mixture of old checkpoints, um, which has the advantage that you can actually see what the rate of improvement is over time. Uh, if you're playing against the same parameters, then you will have zero reward because it's a zero sum game. Uh, and you can't really tell if you're learning or not. But if you have a positive reward against, uh, you know, checkpoints from a few hours to a day ago, then you know that you're you're actually learning something. Uh, and then, of course, the the modern solution to this would be something like Alpha Star League, uh, where you you have a Nash and you want to be sort of at the leading edge of your your Nash equilibrium. Okay, uh, so how did it go? Um, this is kind of a funny story. I, I, after I first implemented the multiplayer version of it, I, I left it running um, and I, I checked after a day and it was really bad, uh, but then I, I forgot about it. Um, and then the, the high point of this whole project maybe was a week later uh, when I remembered that I left it running and I looked at it and it was 
uh, it was really good. It was doing all the things that a professional Smash player would do. Uh, I'm maybe an amateur Smash player at best, and it was definitely better than me when I tried playing against it. Um, and then I let it run for another week and took it to some uh, local tournaments uh, where I actually had to play against some professional players. Um, and this is sort of the uh, table of all the results it got against all the professional players I could find who would agree to play against it. And it had a positive uh, kill-death ratio against all of them. Uh, not perfect, but uh, none of the pro players could, uh, could figure out how to beat it. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Can I ask a question about that part? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So you were emulating the GameCube playing the professional players. Did that cause a lot of lag or did that cause any problems? Uh, so I was, um, so yeah, so this was emulated on a laptop that basically I just had for this purpose. Um, the game, if you're just running one instance of the game, it's it, it runs pretty pretty well on a laptop. Um, it, even even like I think it was like a 2014 laptop, there wasn't any lag really. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So let me get into some of the limitations of this. Um, uh, so. First of all, I'll start on the left. Uh, hope, hopefully this, this GIF uh, is, is working for everyone. Um, so one player, not a pro player, found out that if you just hold down on your control stick and, and crouch, then Philip, the, the AI, kind of goes crazy and doesn't know what to do and actually commits suicide. Um, this is basically happens very consistently. I actually I made this video last night um, and uh, it will basically do it every time. Uh, so it, it, clearly, it doesn't do well against things that are out, out of distribution, because um, uh, you know it, it's never seen anyone do this during training. So that's not too surprising. Um, but that aside, uh, so on the right is actually some footage from uh, playing against one of the professional players. So here, the human player uh, is the one holding their sh shield, which is that red bubble. And then Philip is the one dashing back and forth like a maniac. Um, and this, it, if you know anything about Smash, Smash Bros, this is a very scary situation if you're a human. Basically, if you, you know that if you ever let go of your shield, uh, the AI is going to punish you for it. Um, and this points to the fact that uh, the, the AI has inhuman speed and reaction time. Um, and playing, playing Super Smash Bros, without or, or with, with with perfect reaction time, it's just a very different game. And it's it's not really a level playing field between the humans and the, the AI. Um, and that's some that's a common complaint that basically everyone who who faced off against it had. Um, so basically the rest of the project I spent trying to fix this limitation um, and and try to level the playing field. Uh, so my my solution to that was to add in some action delay. Um, to, to, to force the AI to, to have at least human-like, not, not perfect reactions. Um, and I think this uh, basically will remove any of the degenerate inhuman behavior that, that we see, um, where it's, it's really not playing the same game that, uh, that humans are used to. Uh, so I did a bit of research and found out that humans have around the 300 milliseconds visual reaction time. Uh, it's a bit less for, for audio. Um, uh, all of this varies a lot with the complexity of the task. So very simple task, like press the button as soon as the light turns green, might have less than 300 milliseconds, more like 250, whereas much more complex tasks that you know require you to say, like, are these two words synonyms? Uh, when two words appear on screen, we'll have much longer uh, reaction time. Uh, so it's not a totally well-defined concept, uh, but I chose like around 300 milliseconds uh, to be to be a reasonable number, uh, and this uh, typically will correspond to about six agent actions for for the AI. Um, now, this adding action delay to DeepRL uh, poses a number of issues. Uh, one of the simpler ones is that it makes credit assignment harder, simply because the there's now some extra time between the 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 rewards and the and the actions. 
Um, that's not too hard to deal with. Uh, much more uh, uh, challenging is that it makes the control problem very difficult. Uh, and in particular, uh, when you're you know when you're in an MDP, the correct action to take depends a lot on the state you're in. Uh, but if you now have this delay between the time you chose the action and the time it actually gets executed, that means that uh, the action will get executed in some unknown future state, which may be you know somewhat different from the state you're currently in, uh, especially in a very fast-paced game like Smash Bros. Uh, so that that makes things uh, quite difficult. Uh, from a control point of view. Uh, so uh, to convince you of this, uh, I well, actually hold on. Okay, yeah, I remember this slide. Um, uh, yeah, this is just here. I'm just showing the difference between uh, non-delay and having delayed. Uh, so on the left is uh, sort of a, a policy unrolled over time without delay, where the action you take uh, uh, immediately influences the next state. Uh, whereas if you have delay, the action you take sort of spend some time in transit and then influences states uh, far into the future potentially. Okay, so, all right, yeah. So here, here are some experiments I ran. Uh, this is for Smash Bros. These are some learning curves uh, where uh, I'm uh, varying the amount of delay the agencies and this is in single player Smash Bros. So I'm, I'm playing against the in-game AI, which is not a very strong uh, AI, but it's a good, uh, a good benchmark. Uh, so in, in light blue, the top curve uh, is with no delay. Uh, and then uh, each subsequent curve adds in, I think, one agent step, uh, which is uh, 50 milliseconds in this case. And as you can see, uh, even just the very first step really reduces performance a lot. And then every subsequent step uh, reduces it even more. Um, so it, it makes even beating the really not very strong in-game AI um, much harder for, uh, for at least vanilla uh, deep around. Uh, I also tried this with a bunch of different Atari games, uh, and you can see a similar pattern where uh, you often lose a huge amount, even just going to one step of delay, um, and then going all the way up to five agent steps, uh, it gets progressively worse. Okay, um, so how how do we solve this? Uh, the solution I came up with um, is based on an observation from how human perception works, actually. Uh, which is that whenever we see moving objects, we actually perceive them slightly ahead in space. Uh, this is what allows us to like catch very fast objects like baseballs uh, or, or return serves in tennis. Um, and there's even an optical illusion called the flash lag effect that uh, illustrates this that you can look up and, and there's some there's some YouTube videos on it. Anyways, we can use a learned environment model to do the same thing. Uh, namely, we can uh, predict what the state will be at the time that our action is actually executed and give our policy a, a better estimate of that state uh, rather than just give it the, the state now, which might be very different. Uh, so this is what it would look like uh, unrolled in an agent where uh, we take the, the output from our recurrent core and then roll out uh, some number of iterations of our uh, environment model to match, uh, match the delay and then give our policy something that is hopefully similar to the actual state at the time that that action will be executed. Um, so this turns out to work fairly well. Uh, here's a couple experiments. One on the left uh, is uh, in single player smash against the in-game AI, uh, where I have an agent with four frames of delay, or sorry, four, four agent steps of delay, uh, and uh, varying amounts of prediction. So in, uh, in blue here uh, is an agent that does no prediction, and red is an agent that predicts two agent steps ahead. And then an origin is an agent that predicts the full four uh, uh, steps ahead. And it, as you can see, the, the orange curve uh, is the one that, that does bust. And on the right, we have uh, a similar setup where uh, we're now having, uh, again, three agents with zero, two, and four frames of prediction uh, and, and four frames of delay uh, co-training against each other. So this is a, a multiplayer setup where uh, all, all, all three agents are getting experience from uh, playing against each other. And uh, blue, uh, Without, that does no prediction does worst, green with two frames of prediction does a bit better, and then red with four, the full four frames of prediction does uh, way, way better than both of them. So I think this shows pretty clearly that um, this prediction is, is uh, pretty effective. Um, and also qualitatively, when I was training, especially multiplayer agents with delay, uh, there's, a, there's just a very big qualitative difference. The ones that weren't doing any prediction were uh, really terrible. 
uh, I was uh, I would have been embarrassed to uh, to have them um, uh, to, to to even show them off. Uh, and here's some results against human opponents. Uh, the the TLDR is that they're they're good but not superhuman anymore. Um, so uh, in the table on the right, uh, you can see uh, the results against uh, one top 50 player at the time, um, number one player in the UK, uh, where uh, uh, agents with six and seven steps of uh, delay were able to take some games uh, against him, uh, although they no longer had a positive record. Um, and these uh, these wins aren't, they're not just uh, kills and deaths, they're actually uh, getting uh, winning a whole match, which means getting first to four kills. So there, it's a bit more meaningful uh, than than just kills and deaths, but it's still still a um, uh, not a winning not a winning record. Uh, and then qualitatively, the people who played against these uh, agents trained with uh, delay and prediction were that they were they were more human like than than before, um, uh, but uh, still still relied a lot on precise reactions uh, and and uh, were, were exploitable. Um, all right, and that, that's about where I stopped. Uh, that's around the time I joined DeepMind and, and, and stopped working on this. So let me just uh, make some remarks uh, to conclude. Um, first of all, I think delay isn't solved yet, uh, clearly. Um, uh, I think there's a few things that we could do to, to improve the situation. Uh, one is that the Opponent is considered part of the environment uh, as far as the environment model is concerned. Um, and I think uh, this is obviously not true. The environment is sort of a deterministic or stochastic, but it's, it's definitely not optimizing against you the way your opponent is. Uh, so I think um, something like combining uh, mu zero, which is uh, another uh, model based algorithm uh, that does uh, consider the opponent's options. Uh, combining that with uh, this notion of undoing delay uh, could be quite successful. Um, I also think exploration isn't solved yet in RL, unfortunately, uh, uh, even five years later. Um, so th there were big parts of the um, Super Smash Bros strategy space that the even the very best non-delayed agents um, uh, uh, weren't, weren't exploring at all. Um, uh, and they sort of made up for it by just being really, really good at the parts at the parts of the uh, game states that they did explore. Um, and then in other games like Dota, uh, people had to rely on like heavy reward shaping uh, for opening AI5 uh, or uh, Alpha Star uh, had to use millions of human games and imitation learning uh, in order to um, sort of start from a place where the AI was um, capable of executing all like the full set of strategies that, that humans at least uh, thought were uh, important. Um, and actually this last technique could be applied to, to Smash Bros. Um, uh, there's actually already a data set of 100,000 tournament matches uh, which have been recorded. Um, and uh, since COVID, a lot of people are actually now playing online using the emulator um, and uh, Pretty much every game is being automatically recorded and placed into a hard drive somewhere. Uh, so this is a huge amount of data, and I think uh, could definitely be used to do something like Alpha Star uh, for Smash Bros. Uh, I've dabbled into it a bit, but haven't uh, haven't gotten anything too interesting yet, unfortunately, uh, to show off. Okay, so that's that's it for Smash Bros. Are there any questions before I move on? Yeah, I have some questions. This is John Barras. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. Interesting talk okay. now. Uh, from the point of view of decision theory and control theory, we know that the way to handle delay is prediction. Right? And there has been a tremendous amount of works on that in the control literature to try to use model predictive control and other prediction methods to fight the, the delay. The question I have is if I have two agents playing, they may have different delay characteristics. So sometimes my predictions or estimates may be conflicting between the two. How do I handle those? That's the first question. And the second question is, when I play games and I watch my grandchildren now play games, especially this kind of stuff, uh, they recognize patterns. In other words, there's memory and knowledge here that plays a big role. So where, where do you account for that in your work or have you thought about this? 
Um, so, yeah, so let me start with the, the first question. Um, so you're saying if, if you have two agents that have different amounts of delay. Uh, or the delay may time varying. I mean, because essentially think of a delay as reaction time, right? And right. you, can, you can think of the same problems in, 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 in car driving. You have car drivers and they have different response times. And, and uh, in addition to prediction, you have to also try to estimate the response time of the other player. So right, that, right. That makes it very difficult. Okay? It's a second order effect, but it's important. Yeah. So I, I think. So I think from a from a first person perspective, it's clearly your your own delay is is the more important one to, to deal with. And I, I guess you know there could be you know if you're playing an online game, there could be varying amounts of you know connection quality that could could have that change over time. Um, so my I'm a deep learning believer, so I think we should just let the deep networks learn to handle everything. So if you want to, if you want an agent which can handle varying conditions, like varying amounts of delay, we should simply build that into its training environment. Um, and, right, let me give let, you a let me give a counter example to that. Okay. Sure. And I won't mention names or anything, but I was in a famous lab about a year and a half ago by some famous AI people, and they gave me some similar story as far as learning delay and behavior by deep learning. And I say, give me the problem. I built a very simple model of the problem, analytic, that I was confident it was covering the main, the essential things. I solved it, okay, by using Laplace transforms, gave the back to them. Of course, it involved prediction and it beat their algorithm. What I get out of this discussion with them was that we should not abandon models just for data. We should use combination of models and data. Uh, because they save us time and they make decisions faster. I would like to hear your comments on that. Um, so you're saying we should, so we we shouldn't abandon models in favor of data. So uh, I think you're using model in a very specific sense that I might not be understanding. Yeah, I have I mean, an, I have a model about how things are moving that I may adapt. It may involve different modes, but the model is a compaction of what I learned. And I've tested it and it gives me, you know, a lot of nice predictions. It can be physics, if you like, it can be mechanical, it can be... I don't know. Yeah. Okay, I, I, so, was, mu I was muted, I'm sorry. So the, the um, model can be something you learn and you compact it to a model that you can use. And this can be a differential equation, a differential equation, some, some, a table. But I have high confidence that it gives you good predictions. That's what I call a model. Versus trying to go all the way, all the time from data completely. Hey, yeah, hey, John, well, I think can, can, I, can I just interject? After this, we need to move on to the presentation. OK, fine. Uh, thanks, Justin. Yeah, so um, I think I don't think they're mutually exclusive. If you look at an algorithm like mu0, it, it uses mm -hmm. data to learn the model, and then I think quite effectively uses that model uh, in its uh, in its decision making. Uh, I I think that to me that sounds like a pretty good solution. Um, I think we're pretty far away from AIs that can sort of know how to do physics and then do physics on their environment and then use the equations they come up with to um, uh, <laughs> to help them make decisions about you know which way to point the art artillery uh, and things like that. Although that's, I think, a good segue to my next talk on theorem proving, where it is AI is trying to work with equations, more or less. Um, so, okay, let's go on. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the questions. Let me see if I can. All right, so hopefully everyone sees uh, my title slide on training a first order theorem prover from synthetic data. Uh, so this is work with um, uh, my colleagues at DeepMind and uh, it's what I've been working on for the last um, almost two years. Okay, um, so let me start uh, by talking about theorem proving is a domain for AI. So it's uh, one of, um, I think it's one of the most exciting domains for 
for AI to be applied to right now. Um, and I, I'm gonna go over some of those reasons right now. Um, so first of all, I think it, it, it's very clean. Uh, the environment is fully specified by the rules of logic and it's very efficient to simulate. So you, there's no need for um, rendering or for physics or for, uh, you know, for your agents to do perception. Uh, it's, it really just boils down to um, just the, the cognitive task of, 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 uh, of logic. Uh, it's also, it's a very rich, composable, and open-ended task space. Uh, so uh, th these are all things that we, uh, you know, we really care about. Um, and it's very easy to express very challenging intellectual tasks. Uh, so, you know, mathematics is sometimes considered one of the most difficult intellectual tasks that, that, that humans engage in. Uh, and it's very easy, you know, things like from Maslow's theorem or the Collatz conjecture are actually very, very easy to express. Uh, so it gives us access to a wide, very wide range of diverse and, and challenging uh, intellectual tasks uh, that really test our uh, AI's abilities. Um, and then uh, sort of a bit more speculatively, I think um, aside from just math problems that you might be used to, uh, there's lots of problems of actually practical interest that fall into the domain of theorem proving. Uh, so things like software verification, which is actually one of the main industrial uses for theorem proving, so that's sort of proving that your program doesn't crash, uh, which is a uh, certainly a useful property uh, to things like program synthesis, which is uh, giving a program that satisfies certain properties, uh, to even things like physical and chemical simulations. Uh, basically, anything where you can write down the equations is something that could potentially be tackled by a sufficiently strong theorem prover. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, there are also some challenges. Uh, first of all, you have uh, an expanding state and action space. Uh, it's certainly a, it's a very difficult search problem with uh, exponentially many trajectories to uh, to explore. Uh, and then th the fact that the state and action spaces are expanding certainly poses a problem for neural networks, which tend to like fixed size data. Um, but I think the biggest challenge, at least from a, from a machine learning point of view, is that there's, there isn't that much supervised data. Um, so uh, in, uh, uh, in the paper I, I wrote recently, I, I observed that the, the size of one of the major theorem proving data sets is only 22 megabytes, uh, which is about 25,000 times smaller than uh, the data used to train a powerful language model like GPT-3. Uh, so it's this lack of supervised data uh, that I'm uh, particularly focused on um, in my theorem proving work and that I'll, I'll talk about today. Okay, uh, so let me talk about uh, our approach. Uh, so the data set that we're working with is called Thousands of Problems for Theorem Provers, or TPTP. Uh, so already in the title, you can guess that the size of the data set is somewhere in the thousands, which is uh, not really big enough for modern, you know, big high scale uh, uh, deep learning. Um, so this, uh, this TPTP data set has been a benchmark for automated theorem provers uh, or ATPs for over a decade. Uh, the best ATPs are uh, what are, are called E and Vampire. And you can think of them kind of like Stockfish, which is, you know, was the best chess AI before um, Alpha Zero came out. Um, and, and E and Vampire in particular are very much built for TPTP. Uh, so a lot of the improvements that go into it are um, uh, purposely designed in order to do well on next year's competition. Um, and uh, just more concretely, we use a subset of 606 uh, so-called first order without equality problems. So these are uh, problems in first order logic uh, and uh, in particular a flavor of it that is uh, the sort of the simplest flavor of it. Um, and we chose this in order to uh, not have to build a very complicated theorem prover ourselves and just let the machine learning do most of the work. Uh, and the problems in, in, in this 606, uh, subset of 606 uh, uh, covers algebra, geometry, number theory, and set theory with a total of 10 different axiom sets. And these axiom sets uh, will be important uh, later on. Uh, so one of the interesting things about our approach is that we don't train on any of the test theorems. So none of these 606 problems uh, ever get seen during training. Uh, which is quite different from a lot of the other approaches uh, in, in machine learning in general, actually. Uh, instead, what we do is we take the axioms uh, and we synthetically generate or propose training problems from these axioms. 
and we use those to train a, uh, uh, a theorem prover, uh, which is you know the neural net, and it's using something kind of like reinforcement learning, although not quite. And I'll get into what I mean by that later. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the nitty gritty of the of, of the logical system we use. So we're using something called the resolution calculus. Uh, which is a set of inference rules for first order clauses. Um, a clause, uh, just in, briefly, is a type of first order proposition, such as for all x, p of x implies q of x. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much more detail about the specifics of first order logic, but you should, you should just think of the clause as the uh, sort of atomic unit uh, of, of theorem proving. Uh, so everything is done by manipulating clauses. Uh, and finally, an inference is the implication of one clause by one or more other clauses. Uh, so this is something like if you, if you know that A is true and you know that A implies B, then you can deduce that B is true. Um, and uh, this is you know, a very simple inference, but th there really isn't that much more to it. Uh, finally, uh, the type of proofs that we do are known as reputation, reputation proofs. Uh, so this is where if there's a conjecture you want to prove, you first negate it and represent it as a set of clauses. Uh, and then you use the resolution calculus to derive false. Uh, so that means that you know if your the negation of your conjecture implies false, uh, that means that your original conjecture uh, must have been true. So these are proofs by contradiction. Okay, so here I have a, a picture showing a little bit of what that looks like. Uh, so typically, uh, your conjecture will be in the form of axioms imply conclusion. Uh, so that means that the negation of your conjecture uh, is in the form axioms and negated conclusion. Uh, so here in pink, uh, I've shown the clauses corresponding to the axioms. Uh, and then in green, I've shown the clauses corresponding to the negated conclusion. Uh, and then in, uh, the, in white, I have intermediary clauses, which are inferences uh, made based on these initial pink and green clauses. Um, and then at the end, uh, you come at this blue clause, which represents false. That means that you've found a contradiction in your negated conjecture, which means that your original conjecture was true. So I know I went through that pretty fast. Are there any questions? Okay, I will move on then. So uh, I'm gonna do a brief aside to talk about our method of proposing theorems. Uh, to train on. Uh, so this is something that we call the Ford proposer, and it's almost identical to what you saw on the previous slide before. So instead of starting with the axioms and negated con uh, conclusion, we start with just the action axiom clauses in pink. Uh, then what we do is we take random resolution steps um, until we arrive at a final clause, which we then negate to uh, result in the green clauses you saw on the previous slide. Um, so it's, it's almost the exact same procedure as we use during proving, uh, except that uh, the, these um, resolution steps are taken more or less randomly. Um, okay, so if you think about the resolution calculus, it sort of gives you an, a state space and an action space for forming proofs. So the naive thing to do would be to just apply RL to it as a decision procedure. Um, however, it turns out that that doesn't work too well. Um, and I'll have a slide a bit later uh, explaining why. Um, instead, we're going to use something known as the given clause algorithm, which is an A star like search procedure that's built on top of resolution. And this is the algorithm that's used by all of the best first order automated theorem provers. Uh, so let me give a quick outline in like pseudo pseudocode. Um, so whenever you encounter a new clause, what you do is you assign to it a cost and you place it into a priority queue. And then at each step, you pick the minimum cost clause and generate all of its consequences. And then you repeat this until you have found the proof or you've run out of time, typically. Uh, so let me just animate this for you. Uh, so uh, at any point in time, you'll have a set of clauses known as the active clauses. These will usually, uh, or initially, these will typically be the uh, just the initial clauses of your negated conjecture. Uh, and then you'll also have what are known as the unprocessed clauses, which are all of the uh, logical inferences um, that are available to be made from your active clauses. Each of the, your unprocessed clauses has a score uh, and you'll pick 
the one with the minimum or, or maximum score, in this case is E. You'll add that to your active set. Uh, you'll compute all of the new logical inferences that are available uh, by adding E to your active set. Uh, and then you just continue. So now let's say L is the one with the minimum cost. Um, add that to your active set, generate some more clauses. Uh, so it's sort of a prioritized breadth first search through the space of all clauses, trying to search for, for that one false clause. All right, so from everything I said so far, it should be sort of fairly obvious where machine learning can come in uh, to, to help. And that's in the cost function. So let's train a neural cost function to evaluate these clauses for us. So the first question we might ask is like, what should we, what is the objective of this neural network? What should it be trying to predict? What should the costs of, of clauses be? Um, so the, the insight we use is that the, an optimal cost function would avoid ever searching through useless clauses, uh, where a clause is used if it is on the proof path, which is to say that if it is one of the ancestors of false, uh, if we do in fact find false. Uh, so this gives rise to what I call the appears in proof binary classification of objective, uh, where every clause uh, has to be classified either as positive or negative. Positive means it was in the proof, negative means it wasn't in the proof. Uh, and actually, I think this is a very powerful sort of search distillation, uh, similar to alpha zero, because the, the search algorithm generates many, many clauses. Uh, and then you, you look back at it and you find, and you ask which ones of those were useful. And then you try to, uh, try to get your cost function to, to only predict those uh, and, and penalize all the rest. Um, so there's a few questions about how to do this that I won't get into. Uh, the details of, but uh, it, typically the number of positive examples is uh, much, much smaller than the negative examples. So there's questions of uh, how you should uh, do the weighting and sampling between them. Uh, and also uh, it's sort of unclear to do if you don't find the proof because then none of the clauses appear in the proof. But uh, so does that mean, should you make them all negative examples? Currently what we do is that we just throw them all away. We don't even train on them. Uh, but uh, that, yeah, so those are a couple of uh, sort of shortcomings with this approach. Uh, nevertheless, we find that it works pretty well. Uh, so here I've just uh, shown um, sort of what, a, what an example proof might look like. So on the left, we have uh, four initial clauses uh, that represent uh, our uh, negated conjecture. And then on the right, we have a bunch of inferences made from those clauses. And then let's assume that we actually found false. So that means that anything that is an ancestor of false is green. It's something that appeared in the proof. Uh, it was actually useful. And everything that is in red is a negative example. So we want our cost function to score uh, very highly the green clauses and, and give low scores to the, to the red clauses. Uh, and that's the data that we use to train our neural network. Um, so okay, actually, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip past this slide. Uh, and get into the uh, details on the neural networks. Uh, so we used two different neural networks in this uh, in this work. Uh, one was uh, just a multi-layer perceptron uh, using a very small fixed size representation of clauses. Um, it's a very low capacity model, doesn't have many parameters, uh, and there's already major information loss just in the, the, the features, which um, are just things like uh, how many variables are in their clause, how many functions, how many literals, they're just very, very, course statistics of the clause. Uh, and then we also tried a uh, transformer, uh, which uh, was based on a graphical representation of the syntax tree of the clause uh, with something known as spectral features for the uh, node embeddings. Uh, these are something that are um, sort of the graph analogs of the sinusoidal positional embeddings that are used in typical transformer uh, sequence models. And these are very high capacity model, lots of parameters, and there isn't any information loss uh, in, in the transformation into from the clause to the input to the neural network. OK, uh, so here, uh, uh, here's a summary of, of the results. <laughs> There's a lot of information here, but the key thing to, to look at is uh, to zoom in right here on the left, uh, where uh, so on the left chart, we have um, results on the Ford proposer. So this is the synthetic data. Um, and 
this is the data for each axiom set individually, and then uh, uh, the total across all axiom sets. Uh, and in red, we have our transformable model. In green is the multilayer perceptron. In orange is uh, E-prover, which is one of the stockfish type provers I was mentioning before. And then in blue uh, is a basic version of our prover that doesn't use machine learning. Uh, so you don't really need to look at blue. Um, but if you, if you look at each axiom set and in total, uh, the transformer is actually beating E-prover. Uh, and the MLP is actually quite close to it as well. Uh, so we're actually beating one of the state-of-the-art provers uh, on our own synthetically generated data, which I think shows the, um, the power of machine learning. Now on the right, uh, we are not beating E-prover, unfortunately. Uh, there's still a ways to go there. Uh, but I would argue that we actually see pretty positive transfer. Uh, so we're way above the, the blue um, uh, the blue bar uh, across all axiom sets and in total. Um, so now I'm going to uh, look at the data a, a bit more closely. Um, and in particular, I'm going to look at how much time we're taking to solve uh, the various problems. So again, on the left, we have synthetic data. And on the right, we have um, the actual TBTP data. And for those of you not familiar, these are survival plots, where on the x-axis, we have the number of problems. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the runtime. Uh, and it's better to be further to the right and further down. That means that you know, the lower you are, the less time it took you to solve those problems. Uh, and then again, in red, we have the transformer, in uh, green, the MLP, and in orange, the uh, E-prover. Uh, and so uh, there, uh, if we look on the left, uh, we see that the transformer, particularly on the, uh, the hardest problems, is taking less time than the MLP. Uh, and then this actually, we, we see the same trend uh, uh, on the right as well, uh, with the transformer generally taking less time than the MLP to solve the same problems. Uh, so uh, the transformer model, by the way, is much slower uh, to run. Uh, so it's not, it's not generating, it's not searching as, as much as the MLP, uh, but uh, it seems to me be, be making better decisions, uh, so much so that, that it's actually taking less time. Um, and we're, actually, we're also not seeing any overfitting. Uh, so one thing we were actually quite afraid of is that the, the transformer with its much higher capacity certainly, certainly would do better on the synthetic data, uh, but that it would overfit and, and that wouldn't transfer to, to doing better on TPP. And we actually don't, don't see that. We actually see similar improvement on, on both synthetic and real data. Uh, and this, this improvement is even bigger if you switch the y-axis to be search steps uh, or number of plots generated. Uh, so here there's like a consistent order of magnitude improvement between the transformer uh, and the MLP. Uh, and again, this, we see this both on synthetic and, and real data. Uh, so I think this shows that we're, we're, we're actually really learning something from the synthetic data uh, that allows us to make uh, the, the search decisions uh, fairly intelligently. And if you, if you squint at this region on the, the, real, the axis of the, uh, the, the chart with the real data, uh, there is actually a regime where for a certain search budget, we're actually solving more problems uh, than eProver, uh, which was actually, in some sense, optimized for the TPTP data set. Uh, so I think that's quite promising. Um, th there's definitely a long way to go, um, but this is, I think, a strong step in the right direction. Uh, and uh, I'll, let me just uh, conclude by talking a little bit about um, where, where we're going to go next. So I think, first of all, it's pretty clear that we need better synthetic data. Um, there isn't, we're close to 100% on all of the uh, synthetic data uh, axiom sets and in total. Um, so, uh, so there isn't really even that much more to learn. Um, so how do we get better synthetic data? Uh, one answer that I'm pretty excited about is uh, using machine learning in the proposer itself. Uh, so uh, when I was quickly going over the way we pr propose theorems, we basically just take random logical inferences. Uh, there's uh, almost no bias towards anything. Uh, and certainly, we could use machine learning to, to be smarter. 
Uh, so let's use machine learning and the proposer to optimize for something. Um, but what, what should that something be? Uh, first of all, we probably want to optimize for small problem size, uh, sort of like an Occam's razor prior. Uh, so by default, the, the, the current proposer, uh, there's a sort of a blow up in the size of the theorems that it generates. Uh, it's basically a bunch of junk that doesn't look anything like real humans that a, uh, a human would care about. Uh, second of all, we could try to optimize uh, directly for difficulty. Uh, so we could try to set up some sort of two-player game where the proposer is trying to find theorems that are challenging for the prover to then train on. Um, and then this, this could have some of the same really nice benefits that like you know, multiplayer games like Alpha Zero and Star, uh, Alpha Star um, uh, have seen, where you, the arms race leads to like greater and greater competency on both sides. Uh, finally, one of the really challenging bits in this sort of work is maintaining diversity. Uh, because if you use something like machine learning or reinforcement learning to optimize for anything, um, you will you will just get sort of the one most optimal solution. So you'll get the one hardest problem or the one smallest problem. But that's not very good as a training set to, to train on. Uh, so you, you have to be careful to maintain uh, diversity in your proposer, even as you're optimizing for difficulty or size. Um, and then finally, I think, we, could, we might have to go even beyond problem size and, and, and difficulty of problems. Uh, so uh, certainly small difficult problems are interesting, um, but I think there is more to it than that. Uh, so what is an interesting problem or theorem? Um, I would argue that a theorem uh, is useful, uh, is, uh, sorry, a theorem is interesting if it is useful, uh, in particular if it's useful as a lemma for solving other problems. Uh, so this is a unique feature of the mathematical task space, which is that every task that you might try to solve, that is to say every theorem, uh, can in fact be, be used as a lemma in, in, in future problems. Uh, and this is something that can be uh, directly detected. Uh, so you could generate a theorem, give it to a prover, uh, see if that theorem helps the prover in, in, in proving other theorems. If so, maybe that was actually a useful theorem. Uh, and this, this could be used as feedback uh, for the proposer in order to generate uh, actually interesting and useful, uh, useful theorems. Uh, so anything that is uh, objectively measurable uh, can, in fact, be uh, be optimized for. All right. Anyways, all all of this is is uh, work in progress, and um, hopefully will uh, will be enough to uh, take us uh, all the way to to the top of TBTP and and beyond. All right. So that. Uh, that's it for me. Let's. Um, I, I'm open to taking any questions now. All right. I guess. Sorry, um, everyone was muted. Um, oh, okay, I have some yeah, questions. Go ahead, ben. Um, so, um, you mentioned that you're worried about overfitting on the synthetic. So, how much synthetic data did you manage to create again? Um, uh, let me actually go back to the slide on the. So the, the synthetic data is, yeah, I, I probably should have mentioned the synthetic data is effectively infinite. So yeah. basically we start with the axioms and then we just take random, we take random inference steps. And this, the, space of inf the space of possible inference steps is, is very, very large. Uh, so if we just have like a uniform policy on the, the inference steps that we take, we, we just end up in uh, we'll end up in a different place every time. So we'll propose a new theorem every time. Um, so I think uh, I did some tests and if you generate like a million theorems in this way, you'll get like maybe 900,000 900, unique ones. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there isn't much, um, okay. uh, there's a lot of diversity uh, or a lot of entropy at least um, in, in the theorems that you generate. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so the concern is just like uh, that you're that there's too much divergence between the synthetic data set and the um, actual data in terms of. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, if you look, if you look at the generated theorems, they're, they're very big. They're not particularly interesting. They don't look anything like the test theorems. The test theorems are actually like yeah. interesting results in algebra and number theory and so on. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So the concern is definitely that the, the train and test are, are, are too different. Uh, I had a question. Do you use existential quantifiers or do you just scolomize everything? Uh, so yeah, so everything is in closed normal form. So all existentials are scolomized. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, I, you mentioned stockfish at the beginning and so I was wondering if you knew about the Stockfish Onion UE. Uh, sort of, they basically added a neural network to Stockfish, um, and oh, particular yeah. these very sort of sparse, shallow neural networks, which are efficiently evaluable, and so they're still able to search like you know 100 million nodes per second with a neural network. Um, yeah. So. I I, I didn't know about that. I guess it yeah. doesn't completely surprise me. Um, sorry. Was so, there, so the was question is, question? I guess, like, instead of, um, I don't know, the, I was just wondering what the potential of using a sort of sparse um, first layer in a, in order to sort of, um, because you mentioned that the, N, the NLP was sort of losing a lot of information in the features. So using some sort of, I don't know, optimizing the features yeah, maybe, and, and the sparse neural network. So yeah, maybe you're saying have a fast MLP or just linear layer. Yeah, but use a better feature space that doesn't lose as much information. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, so that that's something that could work. My opinion is that. Intelligence will always be speed. I think particularly for something as complicated as theorem proving, where the search space is so big that you really need, it's much more important to spend some time making the right choices than it is to make lots and lots of less high quality choices, uh, particularly going forward to like harder and harder problems. Um, so. The problems in TPTP are sort of, they're designed for automated theorem provers. So they're not exactly representative of like research mathematics, which is kind of where we'd like to end up eventually. Um, gotcha. Yeah. I, I have a question. Uh, this is Anupa uh, this So this is in context with the previous work that uh, we discussed for, uh, regarding the smash blues. So we, in one of the slides, it was mentioned that we are considering the opponents to be the part of the environment. So if we don't consider the opponents to be the part of the environment, then are we handling the non-stationarity of the environment? Or is it going to be some kind of future work? Or and how if we are handling, then how are we handling that? Right. So, well, yeah, the, I think the slide said it's not being handled. Uh, in, in a sense, the, I mean, the, the environment model is constantly being learned along with the policy. Um, and so, you know, as the opponent's policy changes, the environmental model sort of has to adapt to take that into account. Um, but it's it's done implicitly. Um, and I think a, an explicit representation of the opponent um, and using some sort of tree search the way AlphaZero does could could lead to better results. And and the environment could be let left alone just to simulate simulate the dynamics and not also have to simulate the opponent's policy. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that's what my question was. Like, are we handling that scenario, like in which the explicit, uh, if we are modeling the opponent explicitly not, and not regarding it as a part of the environment? In your, in your work. How, so, the, if your question is how I'm handling it, it, the answer is I'm not. 
Yes, how? How? Uh, uh, if you if at all you are handling, then how? Uh, or else if you are handling. No, no, it's 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 not being handled. That yeah, that was in the future work section. Oh, okay. thank you. Hi, I also uh, have a question about the Smash Bros section of the talk. Sure. Uh, First off, thanks for giving the talk. I I'm I follow the Smash Bros scene and I remember reading your paper when it first came out on Philip. So really cool to have this talk. Um, uh, my question is, did you do any sort of hyperparameter tuning or other sort of kind of iteration or development when you were making Philip? Because the way you tell the story, it almost sounds like you just left it running and forgot about it and then it just happened to work out. So just wondering if you did any other iteration when you were developing. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can definitely go into, so yeah. Well, the big part I left out was basically I, in, I initially trained it only against the in-game AI. And I kept, like, I, kept, I kept doing hyperparameter search, just trying to have it, first of all, learn it all, and then learn as quickly as possible against the in-game AI. Um, where, where, uh, so, so like there, because it, it's a single player game, the score is much more meaningful and, and it's sort of an easier optimization target for uh, to, to try to, to try to improve from run to run. Um, so the things I played around with were like the network size, the, um, uh, the amount of, uh, entropy actually in the, so the, the entropy term in, in the policy gradient was particularly important to get right. Um, the discount, the sort of length of the trajectory, those are all things I, I optimized in the single pair regime. But then I just, I basically just use those parameters and when I switch to multiplayer. Gotcha. Thanks. That is my question. Cool. Thanks. Hi, I have a quick question related to the theorem proving work. Um, I was curious if in looking at the results, you were able to sort of come up with a character characterization for the types of theorems that were not being proven uh, through your approach? So yeah, um, yeah, great question. So that's actually something we're looking at now. So right now what we're, we're trying to do is um, sort of filter the problems that are generated and only use the, the ones we expect to be difficult, which involves learning a predictor of what's difficult or not. Um, so, so, so that, that's still ongoing. In the past, we, so there, there are a few hyperparameters in the Ford proposer, which, and we play around a bit with those to see, uh, and basically try to pick them to make the problems as difficult as, po as possible. Um, and typically what we found is if we let the Ford proposer generate really big theorems, those were harder, um, at least as measured by, um, we were actually using eProver to measure difficulty. Uh, so size seems to correlate with difficulty, at least roughly. Um, I think that that's the that's the I think that's the best um, predictor we have right now, but we're we're working on trying to build better ones. I see. Thank you. Yeah. And it's it's a bit unfortunate because we we want small theorems. The large theorems are like junk that is is even more out of distribution compared to the test theorems. So it, unfortunately mm -hmm. there's this tension, at least in the like very simple four proposal we built. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, a uh, question about, you mentioned uh, Q learning. Why do you think that did not work? Uh, to, you're talking about the Smash Bros. work now. Um, but just in general, so, it seems like a general point. Why, why is Q-learning bad, bad in general? So I thought, I mean, I haven't thought about this much since I stopped using Q-learning, but back when, it, when I was trying to get it to work, uh, so, so there's a few variants on Q-learning. The, the one that's actually called Q-learning sort of is like, uses this max operator. It's, you know, Q of SA equals R plus max of Q as prime A prime. Um, where you take the max, the max Q value of all actions in the future state. So I think that's really bad because it compounds errors. And I, other people have pointed this out. So that actually didn't work at all when I, when I tried it. And I think there's various tricks to try to get it to work. So what I did was actually use something more like SARSA. Um, 
and Sorcerer actually, it kind of did work at least in single player. Uh, and, uh, but, but I found it not to work as well in, in multiplayer. And I didn't investigate it too much. My guess is that policies are easier to, um, policies are easier to parameterize or easier to learn or easier to represent than, than Q values. Because when you, um, if you're trying to predict Q values, that means that for every single action you might take, you need to predict exactly what the return is, uh, which, which is, you know, you're trying to predict a very specific scalar. Whereas for a policy, you're just trying to predict which one is best, um, which is sort of a coarser grained type of information. Uh, so like, I mean, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information that is superfluous, like the absolute scale of the Q values or, uh, you know, how much Q values that aren't the maximum one are that you're, when you're learning a Q function, you have to pay attention to those. Um, whereas when you're learning a policy, you don't. Um, so that's, that's my guess. Um, I, I think, I think there has been some literature trying to explore this more. Um, uh, but that, yeah, that's, that's my best uh, understanding of it. Thank you. I had uh, three questions just about the um, prover talk. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, first one, you mentioned um, you focus on first order logic without the quality problem. I was wondering what the without the quality means here. Uh, sure. So, um, uh, so, it, so I think what we're using is something called classical first order logic. And there's a, there's a small, uh, how, how do I want to phrase this? So, so classical first order logic, in, in classical first order logic, you have what are known as predicates, which are functions that take one or more or possibly zero objects and return a Boolean. Um, and equality is a predicate that takes two objects and returns whether or not they're equal. Um, and in classical first order logic, you can encode equality sort of as a predicate, same as any other predicate. Um, however, it turns out that equality has certain, uh, certain properties like symmetry, reflexivity, transitivity. Um, uh, and um, you can sort of enhance your logical system to be aware of these properties and to treat equality specially. Um, and this allows uh, your system to do uh, it basically expands the inferences that are possible and allows you to do proofs more efficiently. In particular, what it allows you to do is if you know X and Y are equal and you have X buried in some term very deeply, like F of G of Q of X, um, then uh, you can replace that term with F of G of Q of Y uh, just in one step. Uh, so that's, it sort of gives you some shortcuts that allows you to prove more efficiently. Um, and we, this adds some complexity to your to your proof system, and we wanted to avoid that. Yeah, so that's the story on equality. Um, and then, so for the neural prover, so I was wondering why what was the motivation between behind choosing MLP and the transformer? I was wondering if other architectures work as well, and is this even worth exploring? So, well, the MLP was the simplest thing we could do. So we actually spent quite a while working with it. And it was actually, it, you know, it, it actually did work fairly well. Um, the next to, architecture we tried was actually a, a graph net. And um, we, we had a paper from about a year ago that um, had MLPs and graph nets without transformers. Um, and the graph, the point of the graph net was, again, to, uh, it's sort of like the most natural, I think, architecture because it has a full representation of the of the inputs. Um, uh, but we we actually kind of struggled a little bit with the graph net um, uh, to get it to to work uh, as well as the MLP. Um, and then later we switched from graph nets to transformers. Uh, in some ways, they're they're actually quite similar, even mathematically. You, you can think of transformers as fully connected graph nets. Um, and um, yeah, we just had better success with the transformers. Uh, maybe because they're just they're just better developed models, um, sort of just outside the improving in in uh, sequence modeling. Um, 
yeah, uh, I, I think that's all I have to say about the networks. Thank you. Uh, I have a question on the theorem proofing. Uh, it seems like, you know, from your diagrams, uh, the network is essentially, you're trying to teach it to learn to search, right? Uh, have you measured sort of, sort of like to what extent the network is mimicking eProver or to what extent uh, it's doing something new? Like what kinds of, you know, features is it learning kind of thing? So, um... Yeah, so first of all, I'll say that the, yeah, so you're definitely right that the network is trying to uh, learn to, to search or it's trying to learn what the results of search are uh, similar to, to alpha zero and, and policy dist distillation. Um, so it's actually, it's learning from it. It's actually learning from itself. So what we do is that we um, we have we have our, our network and then we use it to prove theorems and then we use those theorems as uh, so we use those proofs uh, as data to improve the prover, and then we put it back and plug it back in, sorry, to improve the network, and then we plug that network back into the prover. So we're constantly learning from ourselves, um, sort of in an online RL style. Um, so I'm not, I think what part of your question was what the similarity is between what our network is learning and what eProver is learning. Um, unfortunately, we, we're not really sure about that, uh, mainly because eProver uses it. it eProver is using uh, resolution and the given clause algorithm, but it, it's its proof of cal calculus is slightly different from ours. So, it, for example, some of its it, it can take shortcuts that we we don't take. Um, so the, the the proof steps that it takes and the ones that we take aren't directly comparable. Um, so, unfortunately, we. Early on, one of the ideas was just to learn directly from eProver rather than learn from ourselves. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we, we, it was difficult to parse what exactly the proof steps that it was taking were because they, they don't correspond very neatly to, to simple resolutions. Um, I think they were, there might have been another part of your question that I, I've missed. Or did that cover everything? I'm going to assume that covered everything. Oh uh, yeah, Daddy said in chat. Um, 